My guest today is Jimmy Bogard. Jimmy, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming back. It's been a while since you've been on my show. Gosh, and yeah, it has been a while. <laughs> people have been clamoring for more Jimmy. Uh, I, I almost I, believe I, that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Last, yesterday I had, a, I had a, an email pour in. <laughs> um, what do you do these days? I think you're doing something different than last time we spoke. Um, actually, I'm doing the same thing, but just now on my own. So yeah. I've been in software consulting now for like ugh, 15 years now. Um, and I was working for a company called Headspring out of Austin, Texas. And I left, um, I guess, like a week before lockdown to uh, do my own thing, going solo. So, um, yeah, I'm doing my own thing, mainly working with uh, Saliance, which is a, a company uh, from, I guess, Michelle Bustamante is part of that. And whole bunch of other folks so doing a lot of the same stuff you know like software consulting legacy project modernization all that fun stuff um but just you know on my own now uh very cool and it looks sounds like uh that what seemed like a small butterfly effect actually caused an entire pandemic you going into yeah um uh, yeah I don't know the physics of it, but <laughs> you can't argue the cause and effect. <laughs> uh, let's. I, I saw a video of yours where, not too long ago where you were talking about vertical slice architecture. I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but uh, um, and how you'd switched your approach to building applications and designing applications. Um, what's uh, w what was your old approach, and how does this differ? Yeah, so um, I was part of a really large uh, uh, effort to build this, this web application. Um, this is like, oh gosh, back in 2008 or nine, so quite a, quite a long time ago. And this is in the very early days of ASP.NET MVC Classic, the, the old one. Um, and so at that time, like Microsoft didn't really have any directions or recommendations about how to build systems using the framework that they were building. So it's really up to the community to figure out, like, okay, well, you know, what are other people doing? How how should we build these applications and systems? <clears throat> and so, uh, one of our uh, our I don't remember his his title at the time, but he was the he eventually was the president of the company. Um, had this idea of this this layered approach called onion architecture, and the general idea there is that you have like and it's good ideas. Like you have the core of your application is the domain, which is all the business logic where that lies. Mm -hmm. And then outside of there, you have like you know, infrastructure concerns, like you have to talk to a database or have to talk to a file system or APIs that's outside of that. And then the very outside of then is the application uh, application layer. And the, the onion aspect of that is the dependencies go inwards, not outwards. So the application depends on the infrastructure, infrastructure depends on the domain, but your business logic does not depend on infrastructure, infrastructure does not depend on applications. And we use this somewhat rigid, not somewhat, we use a rigid project reference or project hierarchy structure to enforce those rules and those conventions. It said one thing can only talk to the other. Right. Um, the side yeah, effect that's, though is... Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's really popular. I mean, that's... It wasn't invented there. I, I've used that many times. I, I, I picture it more as horizontal slices as opposed to uh, concentric spheres. That <laughs> the onion. Yeah, is, yeah. The whole, the whole yeah, onion the, is a separation of concerns. Um, the the the, the I, I've used it before too. And it was before it was called interior architecture. Right. Like, exactly. Yeah. You know, so it was a very similar idea, except like now we instead of like you know uh, a lasagna, you bring the edges of the lasagna together, and now you have this like circle. Um, there are other names for this too, like hexagonal is another common term for this. Uh, clean architecture is another kind of offshoot. Um, yeah. But so the idea was like, that? well, so I had used that architecture on smaller projects. Smaller being like, I don't know, you know, in the dozens of pages, uh, dozen, you know, dozens of screens. In this application, it was a probably too many, but whatever. It was a long, large number of screens. I'm talking like. Uh, up to a thousand screens, and when when we started to apply this pattern on a much broader scale, and specifically the pattern we were seeing was trying to make our business logic completely unaware of any infrastructure concerns and database concerns. So, like my mm -hmm. business logic had no idea that a database, like or there was a database, but I had, we were very abstracted away from it. 
Sure. Um, and then wh- what we kind of found was that uh, when you take that approach, um, it it was uh, because there were so many screens we were building in the system. We wanted to make sure that we could build these, you know, build screens as quickly as possible, and we don't want the developers to be the bottleneck. So with this very rigid hierarchy, we were having troubles just trying to reason about, okay, I need to add a feature to the system. Where do I need to go to change the code to be able to add functionality and features? We found that our developers, and I even did this on our whiteboard. I, I like, you know, just made a number list. Like, what are the places and things we have to change? If I need to add a field to the screen, how many places and where do I need to go to be able to make that change? And that was kind of our, our benchmark was, uh, you know, trying to make that as easy as possible to just, you know, if I need to add a, a field to a screen, how uh, how easy or, or hard is to do that? that that's and a field we, in the database. It's a field in the business logic layer. There's some mapping between the things. A lot exactly. Um, and with this this layered approach, what we found was that we were having a jump everywhere in the application and the, in the code base to do so. It's like, so you have to go way over here to do something, way over here to do something, way over here to do something. And the other side effect we found was that with a layered approach, we tended to have these these kind of layer god objects that for a given entity or a given kind of uh, you know noun in the system, we would have a class that represented all of the data access logic for that thing, or all the business logic for the thing, or all the, the infrastructure or all the app or the UI logic. So it'd be like, I don't know, we had something like a customer. We'd have a customer repository. That was all the data access logic. We would have customer manager or customer uh, service, which was all the kind of business logic things related to that thing. And when we had a lot of developers working with each other, those those created these kind of uh, pinch points or contention points where many developers were editing the same files wow. to be able to perform some activity. And the final sound effect we saw, this was the kind of the, the worst one, was that when we created these these layer objects, it actually created a lot of coupling from our app, our business logic to that uh, to those applications or to those layer objects. So if we had something like um, kind of like approve invoice, a method on the invoice manager, uh, there might be a lot of different places that needed to mark the invoice as approved, but then we'd have to do a bunch of other stuff. So we found is that these layer objects, we would have a lot of coupling with that object with all the things that used it so that if we needed to change that method we can wind up breaking a lot of other things because these these layer objects actually encouraged that kind of reuse or coupling between the different kind of actions performed in the system mm-hmm. so those layer objects they they kind of promoted this idea of like you should share logic first um and then uh, you know, that gives you reusability, but what that brought with it was a lot of coupling. Mm-hmm. And the last problem I'll say that we ran, ran into was that uh, our application and business logic was intended to be very um, ignorant of the persistent strategy. Uh, but in practice, what that meant that it led to a lot of very inefficient data access code. Because if my business logic doesn't know how to efficiently query something, it just has like some abstraction we would find that, well, it would have to rely on a kind of a lot of features of the ORM to do it for us, like lazy loading to say, well, mm-hmm. I can't be coupled directly to my ORM. So I can't say go fetch these extra things because that's coupling. Every ORM is completely different how they do that. So either I have to create some other new method in my layer object that's abstracted, or I just let the ORM ma- like magically do it for us. So we found it, it led to, by pretending like the ORM didn't exist, it led to us using the least common denominator of these tools um, and led to very inefficient use of those tools. Um, and so that this is kind of awakening for us. Like, okay, we, we tried this in a large scale in a system with a lot of complexity. And we found that the things that were kind of promised with those kinds of architectures um, didn't, uh, didn't, they, they didn't make good on those promises. They, they kind of fell flat and we found like the, the problems we thought we had, uh, it just generated new problems. It didn't actually solve the problems we, we really had. <laughs> uh, and this, uh, this uh, sounds like this is more pronounced on a larger project. The, yeah. the more developers, the more classes, the more entities, the more screens, 
the bigger that problem is. Yeah, it just it just started to grow and grow, and our even our developers were getting so frustrated that we had a um, we had one one day like even the project hierarchy became such a, a kind of convoluted way of like well if something can't reference something else, we would have to create all these abstractions and and you know bend over backwards and jump through hoops to just try to protect this purity of the domain yeah. that cannot reference anything besides you know system dot as if right. there's like something magical about system dot or Microsoft dot. Um, like to, to protect that purity. Mm. So we had this like, you know, there's one big, um, <laughs> it was a, it was a Friday and our tech lead said, okay, this is causing too much friction, this like strict separation of projects. And so he said, you know, everybody check in your code. And by Monday, we're going to collapse all the projects down to like one, because it was too much friction to have this very strict separation of strict separation of projects that was just not adding any value. So that was kind of the first thing of like the first sacred cow uh, we sacrificed was stop having these strict separation of projects, but we still kept all the kind of rules of like layers that just got turned into folders. I see. That must be a big project. Yeah, it was. Um, at the time, it was it was one of the largest ones that Microsoft had seen. So even like we had <laughs> Phil Hack come down to Austin and take a look at what we were doing there because it was just, I mean, this is the, that was also the project that gave birth to Mediator. I'm not sorry, Mediator. Gave birth to Automapper um, and a number of other kind of very common um, patterns that you see in NBC these days. Like that project was the one that kind of gave birth to a lot of those ideas. Interesting. Pain is the mother of invention. Yeah, exactly. Um, so after that, after that experience, though, we... Uh, we never, we know, we never, the client's not going to pay us to like fix the architectural problems, you know, they just want to ship. So uh, the next kind of really big project my team uh, took on, we looked at our experiences from that and said, okay, you know, we put all these patterns in place, but they didn't really seem to solve any problems that our teams actually had. They just seemed to introduce other problems. So rather than kind of blindly going that same path and saying, we'll just do the exact same thing we did before, um, I had our teams like for the first month or so, let's not put any pattern in place whatsoever, like zero. They said data access in the controllers, go for it. Like let's just let's just get rid of all those kind of um, all the abstractions, all the patterns we thought or you know we 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 really believe were helpful, but didn't see the you know didn't see the help. Let's remove all of them. And then see what emerges, what problems actually arise from the systems that we're building, and then try to build patterns right after that. So for the first mm -hmm. like month or so, this is before we bought you know, like the developers on. It was just basically like me, me and a couple other kind of tech lead senior folks of just like let's just see, so let's see what comes out of this, and then let's get to the end and see okay how should we shape the patterns going forward based on the problems we actually see in our code of applying zero patterns whatsoever. So now, so now you've got SQL select statements inside of well. form controls. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, okay, so we didn't go as far as like putting SQL in our views. You know, that was a little too far, but say like, well, we- I, instead I of have putting, seen that, by the way. <laughs> oh, I know, I've, yes, we, um, yeah, we've seen, <laughs> I've seen it all. But I said, let's not, let's not abstract our tools. Let's just use them directly until it hurts. And then right. when it when we see pain, okay, then we'll introduce some pattern. But until we see that pain, let's not add anything. We we okay. need to yeah. we need to let the let the code tell us that we need some that abstraction because abstractions there's a cost to abstraction. It adds it adds complexity unless that complexity is uh, is buying you something. What's the point? Yeah, exactly. So before that, um, back in the previous project, we were already doing this idea of trying to separate out individual request logic from other request logic. So if I had two requests in a system, we wanted to have like different validation rules for each of those requests. Um, each of the response objects were very specific to those individual screens. So we would already create different kind of request and response objects for each of those different screens because we didn't want to we were trying to avoid the case if I, if I change something in one spot, I accidentally broke something somewhere else. Right. And the easiest way to prevent that is just to make both things be separate from each other, just have their own, own requests and responses. So we continued that pattern with this new project. And then we found that, okay, um, 
if if I go to the route, if I were to go to the route of kind of putting all these different things in categorical buckets um, of saying like, well, the request objects go in the request folder, the response objects go in the response folder, the views go in the views folder. We found that for anyone adding functionality to a screen or adding a new screen, we're still jumping around all throughout the system, all throughout the application. So me and my coworker um, at the time said, well, why are these organized apart? Why don't we organize them together? The things that change together should live together so that if I need to add functionality or change functionality of a system, everything that's affected is in one like physical spot on the hard drive. And so that's what we, that's what we did. We, we add, add, introduced this idea of feature folders. That's what we call them at the time as feature folders. Um, and this idea was that for any individual request in the system, everything related to that request was in one sort of pathway in the application logic, um, one distinct pathway, and was on one physical place on disk. So this idea of the one physical pathway in the logic, what we meant by that was um, every request in our application uh, had like a distinct kind of request, input object, a, a distinct response output object, as well as some kind of business logic in the middle that was unique to that one request separate from other requests in the system. So we put all of those things in one spot, the request, the business logic, and the response in one place, like just one class doing the business logic, one request, one response. And we put the uh, any kind of validation logic was living beside it. Uh, the, the HTML, the view for displaying that information was showed as part of that as well, it was the same location on disk. And if we had any kind of JavaScript or styling associated with that, it was also at the same place on disk. So for the entire kind of like end-to-end -end response, request to response, everything was living together in one physical spot. The only thing we didn't really move was the controller and the controller action, um, because at the time there wasn't a lot of flexibility in, in routing. Um, so you kind of still had to say, well, M you know, MVC and Web API knows routes based on these controllers and actions. So those still have to kind of live here. But otherwise, once you get past that, everything else lives in this other uh, location, which housed all the end-to-end -end logic for individual requests in the system. Makes sense. Uh, so, and they were they separated by projects or just by folders? Just by folders. We okay. We also so made a one big project. One big project, and we said we're gonna if we need to separate things into projects, we'll do that because we have uh, we have logic that needs to be shared by multiple applications. Mm -hmm. So having one application with multiple projects didn't really add a lot of things except for, you know, just kind of headaches for us, for our team anyway. Um, so we said, if you need to create, if you have two applications that need to share logic, that's, or share something, that's when you create the project. But don't do it before. You wait till the need arises, and mm -hmm. then you move things out. We still organize things in the folders in our project, so it's you know just the namespaces and stuff like that. But it's I mean it's really no different than like how Microsoft would approach their libraries. You know they don't just break libraries apart for the fun of it. They break them apart because there's some need to have some things in common libraries that have abstractions versus mm -hmm. others. But they don't they don't introduce those just for the you know because they have some you know, some principle in some book that they followed, it's more like, well, we have this need for this separation. And that's why we introduced it because it is, it is costly to introduce these abstractions and these, um, these common libraries. Yeah, so this was years ago you did this. Are, are you still stuck sticking with this pattern in your current work? Yeah, and in fact, um, we, we see this kind of pattern being applied in many other places, um, not just in the .NET world, but I'm, I'm seeing other languages and platforms independently also come to the same conclusion of we should organize our code and logic based on cohesion, not based on like layer types or um, like prototypes or, or like uh, archetypes of, of saying, well, all the, all the controllers go over here, all the views go over there, all the things over there. It's like, well, you don't have to do that. You can organize things that change together in the same location. And then you also built an open source project to help with this, right? Yeah, um, it was somewhat of a twist over the arm to, to do this, um, simply because I'd already built Automapper and I was like 
one you person how much it. work it was. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh gosh, do I want another thing on my shoulders here? <laughs> Uh, but the reality was we were uh, we we also saw that, uh, you know, initially when we were doing this layer based approach, we would create these service classes that service requests from many different requests. So we'd have like a invoice service that had approve invoice, reject invoice, uh, forward invoice, but they were all in one single class. Each one of those methods, though, was only ever used by one individual request. So it kind of broke this this um, some of these OO design principles of you know you should have one reason to change and um, the uh, the methods on a class should not you know they shouldn't have nothing to do with each other besides the name of something they should have so, you know some kind of uh, cohesion within a single class so we said okay if we're breaking these things off into different um, you know breaking these things off in these different slices do we even need these these kind of service classes if they're only if only one method is ever used by one individual class, we said no. So if we don't do that, well, then we wind up having this thing where like, okay, then I'll have the approve invoice service, I'll have the reject invoice service, and each of those classes has one method that is like do the thing, and that's it. So after doing that a lot, we said, you know, there's a there's a broader pattern emerging here, which is I have requests in my system. They need to be handled by some single class or function, and those then return a single response. So uh, over time, we said, well, this is a kind of a broader pattern, um, which we didn't really have a good name for the pattern at the time. Um, there were a bunch of, ones that, bunch of ones that kind of match, but this is general idea of like, I have a request, there's a handler, and there's a response. And that request handler only serves that single request and returns some distinct response. It is not shared by other things. It is really just for these kind of top level requests. Um, so we wound up creating, uh, I just you know had like a hundred lines of code I was copying from project to project to help facilitate that. And this, um, we at the time we, we looked at it and said it was the, the mediator pattern. Some people disagree, but I don't really care. It's, it's not really a good name for it. I haven't found, but the idea is that, you know, you have, instead of your, your calling class for, in our case, our controllers, calling directly into our handlers um, instead they they would send the request to a mediator and then the mediator would then dispatch that request to our handler so that our controller classes don't depend on let's say there's six actions they're not depending on six handlers or six services to do the six requests they depend on one thing which is a mediator they send a request to the mediator and then the mediator dispatches that to the request handler so it, it was it was a a conscious effort in our part to reduce the dependencies in our controllers to help ease like well if i add another controller action i don't have to go to update like unit tests and stuff like that it's already just got the one dependency the other thing we're running into is that we were wanting to do additional logic around these request handlers and if i just depended on a request handler and a controller it made it much much more difficult to try to do things like well make sure that every single request is logged Make sure that I do transactions around all my requests. Make sure I'm auditing my requests properly. And this is at the you know, like the lower level business logic, not the the HTTP levels, like one level down. And that was almost impossible to do if I depended directly on these request handlers themselves, because you're getting into all sorts of complicated stuff with DI containers and proxy objects and decorators. And like, no, we could just have something else that's responsible for all that sort of cross-cutting concern logic. Um, and that gives us a lot more flexibility than relying completely on a DI container to try to do all that work ourselves. So that um, us doing this vertical slice, separating each request and response into different individual um, distinct objects, and then having individual handlers out of that said, OK, this is the sixth project. I've copied and pasted the same dumb code. Right. Let's just go ahead and make an open source project. And at the time, uh, David Fowler just released SignalR. And so me and my naming was like, oh, I, I'm not that clever. So I call it Mediator. With like, I was going to ask you, how do we pronounce that? Is it Mediator, like the pattern? Or is it Mediate R, like a pirate there, would say? <laughs> there is not a correct pronunciation. I just came up with a name. I didn't come up with how to pronounce it. <laughs> okay. So I don't know. Either way, Mediator, Mediate R. I don't know. Whatever. I'm going to use the pirate pronunciation. <laughs> the 
Uh, this is really interesting stuff. This is uh, until I saw your video, I really wasn't. Uh, I was only vaguely aware of it. I was aware of it because somebody in South America that I was working with was using Mediator on a project and pointed me yeah. to it. And so it's I said, oh, not a... check it out. And I saw your name. I oh, I know who I'm calling for technical support. <laughs> it's definitely not a new. Wasn't a new idea. Like a lot of people at the time in the .NET community were coming up with these same ideas pretty much at the same time. Um, and then, like I said, it, we, we saw it in other communities as well. Like, uh, if folks remember the first Angular JS, mm -hmm. um, like b b before it rebranded as Angular, the right. first Angular JS was very much like a, a clean architecture style because it was all Java developers who developed it. And if you've ever used Spring, it's like everything is in a layer folder and there's all these abstractions, whatever. So Angular JS was like that as well, where everything was separated by kind. The new Angular. They said, this is really difficult to understand and maintain because I'm jumping around the application. Why don't we put all of the view components or all the things related to a specific component together on disk, even the tests? So that's what the, the next version of that they did that was let's organize by cohesion instead of by type or kind. Um, and this is, you know, they had nothing to do with, I mean, of course, they weren't paying attention to the .NET world. Why, why would they? Um, it's, it's just kind of interesting that a lot of folks that, are part of these like originally heavily layered sort of architectures, see the issues with them, and most of them do, and say, you know, there's a different way, which is to organize by cohesion and really encapsulate everything related to a specific like request inside one physical spot. Where can where can people go to learn more about this? About both vertical slice architecture and about mediate R. Um, Brian, the best place is probably going to be my blog. So I've got a few blog entries on uh, vertical slice architecture and um, uh, mediator as well. Uh, but I've also got some YouTube videos out there on, uh, you know, I think slices, not layers is, is one of them, as well as another one on vertical slice architecture that really goes more into like the code aspect and how, how the journey I got there. So we can drop some links in the show notes. Uh, absolutely. I, uh, your blog is jimmybogard.com. It's just your name. That's easy to find. Yep. And, the other and thing it's usually up. up. It's up right now. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> and uh, it is. Uh, and the other ones, we can uh, send me those links and I'll put them in the show notes. All right. Sounds good. Jimmy, thank you so much. This is really educational for me. Oh, I hope so. All right. You stay safe. <laughs>David, you asked me to give some folks advice about uh, technology. And so the best advice I've given to people is that uh, friends don't let friends use technology ever.